Well, this Sunday, we are picking up exactly where we left off last week in the 22nd chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. But let me offer up a brief refresher, because not all of us were here last week, and I hope that we all got a few nights sleep between then and now. It's the Monday of Holy Week. Many of the religious elites are not happy with Jesus. He is just stirring up too much trouble. He's pushing them to think outside of their box and their understanding of God and God at work in the world, and they don't like it one bit. We just had three parables where Jesus kind of calls out, but most certainly pushes back against the religious elite, inviting them to reflect on their own behaviors. Included in this group of lessons is our scripture from last week, the parable of the wedding banquet, where Jesus compares the kingdom of heaven to a wedding celebration a king throws for his son. Now, I want you to remember that in Matthew's gospel, the kingdom of heaven is understood to be the act of God in the world, both here and now, and in the past and the future. At the end of last week's service, I hope that we, like the original readers of this text, we're left thinking about how we would respond to the invitation to be part of God's wedding feast, a celebration where all are welcome, the good and the bad. This morning, we find ourselves still in the temple, they've been spending a lot of time there, talking about money. But it's more than just money. It's more than just a question about taxes. The Pharisees, not all Pharisees, but this particular group, as I said, have had it with Jesus. They want him out of town. So much so that they invite a group that they do not get along with, the Herodians, to the temple to entrap him. The Herodians are a group of Jewish people who are, you might say, puppets of Herod. Their allegiance is to the Roman Empire and upholding the oppressive powers over the Jewish people. The Pharisees have an agenda for the outcome of this conversation that involves getting Jesus out of town, or getting the crowds to turn against him that will drive him out, or having him arrested. Now, this is when it's easy for us to step back and chuckle, because we know that's not going to happen, right? Despite their best efforts, despite their flattery, teacher, they said, We know that you are genuine and that you teach the ways that God really is. We know that you are not swayed by people's opinions because you don't show favoritism. So, tell us what you think. Does the law, they're talking about the Jewish law here, their religious code, does the law allow people to pay taxes to Caesar or not. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. Jesus asks them to bring him a coin, the coin that's used for the tax. Tell me, whose image and inscription is this? The emperor's. 
Give the things to Caesar, the th- give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. So I can just picture Jesus flipping the coin back at them. Now, the coin they brought to Jesus wasn't just any coin. This was a coin of the Roman Empire, and it was worth about a day's wage for the average worker. And the tax in question was a flat tax, probably for the census, that all people had to pay the emperor. This tax could only be paid in Roman currency, And the working class was required to pay the same amount as the wealthy and elite. Keep in mind, this tax was paid to the empire. The empire that invaded and occupied their land. They were paying to continue to be occupied. And if they couldn't pay their taxes, they were typically sold into slavery to cover the cost. So you can see how the Pharisees were trying to ensnare Jesus by forcing him to answer one way or the other. If he says, don't pay taxes to the emperor, he'll be arrested by the Romans for treason. And if he says, yes, pay taxes to the emperor, his followers will consider him a traitor for supporting their oppressors. But Jesus, Jesus is so brilliant. And he sees right through what they are attempting to do. Give to the emperor the things that are the emperor's and give to God the things that are God's. The coin in question was Caesar's because it had Caesar's image imprinted on it. Which begs the question, what bears the image of God? What bears the image of God? When I ask myself this question, These words from the first chapter of Genesis come to the forefront of my memory. Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. I'm going to say that one more time. Listen carefully. Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. I bear the image of God. You bear the image of God. We bear the image of God. Humankind bears the image of God. And yes, even Caesar bears the image of God. Just not in the way of a dominating ruler. Jesus is implying that our whole lives, our whole lives should be given to God, giving all that we can, all that we have, all that we are to God's mission of kingdom building here and now. It's an extension of that invitation that we received to the wedding feast last week, and it's so much more than that. This understanding of being made in the image of God, of being imprinted with God's likeness, is called the Imago Dei, which quite literally means the image of God. And it's a theological concept in Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. The divine in me honors and recognizes and sees the divine in each of you. This practice of recognizing the divine in one another and in ourselves is foundational. It's foundational to the work of justice and reconciliation that we are called to do as Christians. Archbishop Desmond Tutu, may he rest in peace, is a great saint of our faith whose work in anti-racism, restorative justice, and peacemaking 
was rooted in his understanding of the Imago Dei, an understanding that was both relational and communal. Because we are made in the image of God, there is a kinship between all human beings as children of God, all eight billion of us, and all violence is family violence. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Caesar is self-centered, self-serving, self-important, self, self, self. He sought power and control and wealth. Jesus taught that God is concerned with community, paying attention to one another, looking out for a neighbor in need, sharing what we can, caring for those who are suffering, working together, working together to create a world of mutual support where the dignity of every human being is recognized and all individuals are truly free and at home. I read a post on social media this week by Rabbi Danya Rutenberg that I keep coming back to. In fact, I saved it on my phone. We will not get anywhere by theming, by theming entire nations and groups of people. We can talk about structures and systems. We can talk about who has power and why. We can remember that Hamas is not the Palestinian people and that Netanyahu is not all Israelis, just as the actions of the U.S. government have never spoken for all Americans. The only way home is a dogged refusal to let anyone be dehumanized. Amen. So how do we go about giving to God what is God's? That's a question we have to ask ourselves every single day, right? With every interaction we have. And there's not one answer. And and it changes. And there is beauty in that. But I believe one way to do this is by acknowledging that we are all made in the image of God and by participating in Jesus' invitation of kingdom building here and now, today. We have to talk about systems and structures. We have to talk about who has power and why. We have to remember that both the Israeli and Palestinian people are children of diaspora, that are both mourning the loss of loved ones, that both fear for their lives, that both want their children and their families to be safe, and we have to talk about the humanitarian crisis that is unfolding. Today, approximately a million Palestinians in Gaza have been displaced within Gaza with no place to go. Hospitals and churches no longer safe, food and water running out, humanitarian aid struggling to get through. You've heard and you've seen the stories. If we are to give God what is God's, then we must call for a ceasefire. We must give what we can to humanitarian efforts and advocate for the aid for hundreds of thousands of Palestinians who are suffering. We must call for the release of hostages by Hamas. We must pray without ceasing for peace for peace, for peace, for all those who are grieving and living in fear. And we must remember that even our enemies are imprinted with the divine's image. Now, I know that this is easy for me to say as a white Christian pastor, speaking from the safety of this sanctuary 
in one of the wealthiest counties of the United States. But I also know that there is a Palestinian family and community in Chicago that is wrestling with the pain of a six-year-old boy being murdered. Just like there is a Jewish community and family in Detroit who knows a similar pain following the murder of a 40-year-old interfaith advocate and synagogue leader. Our Jewish and our Palestinian neighbors are scared, including right here on the peninsula. So maybe this work of restorative justice begins here in a very simple way. I want you to turn to your neighbor, to turn to someone around you, find someone that you can talk to or two or three people. Go ahead and do it. Yes, yes. We are actually doing this. <laughs> you didn't know you'd be participating in the sermon today, did you? And I want you to say, you are made in the image of God. Now say, you are a child of God. Now turn to someone else, turn to someone else, and say, God loves you, God loves you, and so do I. If you are joining us online, I invite you to respond in the chat or text someone or tell someone this week. In fact, I think we all should tell someone this week, you are made in the image of God. You are a beloved child of God. God loves you, and so do I. I have a friend who always ends his prayers with this plea. God, may they know we belong to you by the way we love each other. May it be so. Amen.